Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Saturday Roundtable, sponsored by InsideTexas.com. We have some of, let's face it, the illuminaries of InsideTexas.com joining us today. We've got one Ian Boyd, Justin Wells, the, the other host of the week, our Joe Cook, Cookie's here. And then we've got our special guest, Coach Williams, who's going to talk to us about what's happening in the linebacker world. But before we get to any of that, there have been lots of questions Lots of comments, lots of intrigue about Joe's lip sweater. So here's what I want to understand. Now, Joe, what is the end game here with this lip sweater? Are, are you planning on taking the IROC off some blocks in your front yard, throwing some radials on there and just ripping to some Steely Dan later? What What are you hoping to achieve with this mustache? Uh, I've bought 10 wife beaters and 10 pairs of jorts. So that's going to be my new attire. Um, no, my godmother uh, has turned 70, having a 70s birthday party. Uh, my wife said, why don't you get a prop mustache? And I go, why don't I get a real mustache? And uh, I try this every couple of years. And uh, this is one of those couple of years. So this is about 10 days in. I got 10 days to go and uh, I'm satisfied with the results, to say the least. Now, would you say that your wife is satisfied with the results? She hadn't told me to shave it yet. So that'll uh, that works for me. Oh, that's great. Okay, well, that was a double entendre. Speaking of things that are straightforward, let's talk about CDC and the State of the Union. Now, you got an opportunity to uh, to write about this on the site. So why don't you give us a little bit of a, a synopsis or a summary of what CDC revealed this week? Yeah, we got a few things on InsideTexas.com, but I think the main points uh, to, to know are about Texas moving to the SEC, and Texas making facility improvements. Uh, uh, Chris Del Conte was e extremely excited about the fact that they're heading to the SEC. And one of the things that he announced was that the Longhorns are going to celebrate the move on June 30th on the South Mall, right in front of the tower, uh, with SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey uh, and a lot of different what he called SEC brass being there. So uh, they're very excited about that. He even gave some hints that. This year would be twenty. Uh, this twenty twenty four schedule would have an eight game conference slate, as we all know, playing at Texas A and M. Twenty twenty five would be another eight game conference slate with Texas A and M playing in Austin. And then he hinted at the fact that twenty twenty six sounds like they're going to be moving to a nine game conference schedule. Uh, that's a little bit of an update from some of the other. It's expected, uh, but that's a little bit of the the first kind of public admittance that. 2026 going forward is going to be a nine game schedule. And that works to Texas advantage because uh, Texas SEC schedule, it's always going to include Oklahoma. Uh, and that's always going to be a neutral site game as long as Chris Del Conte, uh, Joe Castiglione at OU, and anybody who cares about the rivalry is in control at the respective institutions. So uh, a nine game slate means four home games, four road games. That's big for the program especially when they want to try to have seven home games per year going forward. Uh, so that was a big update. The other one was uh, uh, facility enhancements. Uh, they're going to make uh, some improvements at DKR. They're going to replace the video board. Uh, on the other side of the video board, they're going to get rid of that mesh screen and add a, an illuminated backlit Longhorn logo. Uh, they have a recruiting lounge already uh, established and opened, and uh, Justin and Coach Williams can kind of talk about how uh, recruits who made their way through Austin have already seen that. And then just going to make some other improvements to concessions, uh, to some of the premium areas, touchdown club. Uh, and as we talked about on our uh, Wednesday live stream with, with Drew Kelson, they're going to have a brand new Letterman's Lounge, and that's going to be important for bringing back some of the luminaries of the program and uh, have given them an, a, a place to, you know, just be and, and, and celebrate and commiserate before games. So a lot of different things going on. Uh, the most important one, maybe one of the most important ones that a lot of people are interested in is when will Campbell Williams field be natural grass uh, that coincides with the brand new practice facility, uh, that's being uh, construction on that is starting in June. Uh, that'll run till 2026. And so as a result, once they can get a, a surface for everybody, whether it's the football team, the band, 
anybody else to practice on that's away from DKR, that's when Campbell Williams Field will return to the Nashville grass that everybody seems to want it to be. We know that this, we know that Austin loves grass. I mean, that is uh, very apparent. We, we've heard that for years, so it, it's finally happening. I'm fired up. Again, I'm just loving all of these today. So, Justin, why don't you tell us a little bit about the QBs that were recently offered? This is a little bit of, I mean, this just doesn't happen. Obviously, Sark is very, very specific with who he does, who he wants to offer uh, in that quarterback room. I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, you know, you know, Texas is like any other program and they offer, you know, a number of players at different positions. Uh, most of them, uh, they're evaluating even further. Most of them are takes on their board at, at, at certain times. And then spots fill up, except for the quarterback position. Sark is insanely judicious with his offers when it comes to uh, quarterbacks. In Arch Manning's class, you know how many quarterbacks he offered in that class? One. Archibald Manning. And so Jared Curtis, number one rated, it's pretty much the consensus number one quarterback out of Nashville, Tennessee. Big, big, prototypical Troy Aikman looking dude. 6'3", about 220, big arm. Um, that's a guy that, that Texas jumped in the mix. That was their first uh, offer for 2026 quarterbacks. That's a pretty big deal. Uh, Georgia got a head start on that one. And I think Georgia's got probably a pretty considerable lead. I know that Oregon is throwing their hands in the mix as well. And so that, that'll be interesting. But but Texas just doesn't offer these guys. They don't offer many quarterbacks. So if they do, you know they check a ton of boxes. I'll give you one guy, the other guy they offer, Troy Hume out of Mission Hills uh, out in California. Now, Troy is much more familiar with Texas. He's been on campus three or four times in the last year. He was at one of the games last year. I think it was the Kansas State game. Uh, he was in attendance. And so Troy and, and Texas have actually been building a pretty good relationship over the years. And, and it just shows you that Sark has a type. He knows exactly what he wants. You know, he, you know, like Ian, Ian's got a type, you know, the type that produces four five, six kids, you know, you know, and so it's like, it, it's just the way it is. It's the way the world is. And so I think it's, it shows us kind of where quarterback recruiting is going for 2026. They got KJ Lacey in the, in, in, in the bin for, for 2025. They, they, they feel good there. They feel like he's solid. So now they're going to start focusing on, on quarterbacks in the next class. And that position's different than the rest of them. Coach Williams can attest. They're going to start, they're going to start prepping those guys two years ahead of time. Because usually those guys, the big quarterbacks, jump in the mix. Usually beginning, middle of their junior season, if not before. In some cases before. I think Gerard Hurd committed when he was a sophomore, if I remember, out of Geyer. And so, hey, Sark's found it. He's got a type. Just like Coach Williams has a type. You know, always smiling, always pretty. Sark's got a type, and it's the big, big armed quarterbacks. And so those are your first two, Jared Curtis and Troy Hume. So, Coach, we're going to talk tomorrow a little bit more about what an offer means. But these offers that are going out right now to these quarterbacks, can you elaborate more or expand a little bit more on what Justin is talking about? I mean, these, these quarterbacks are obviously going to have their own coaches. They're going to have their own training that they're doing. How much – how much – Texas prep would they be doing in high school a couple years out? Um, well, you see it all the time. A lot of kids who you plan on going to a school, those coaches at the high school will learn the concepts of what Texas runs, right? And the, kind of like what Arch Manning did. They got a, got a hand of, hold of the playbook or, you know, some some of what they did at Texas and they, and they implemented it at, you know, Newman High School. So, and with the RPO game, everybody is pretty much running the exact same thing, right? So you just want to implement some of those concepts at that high school level so that when they get to Texas, they already got, they're already familiar with it and running this, you know, the scheme and everything like that. So you're starting to see that a lot. And these trainers are teaching that because you see a lot of one read stuff, especially with the RPO game and everybody runs that. So by the time they get to college, they have somewhat of familiarity with it. Um, it's just about learning the playbook at that point. Joe, you wanted to elaborate a little bit more on that. What is the type for the the Sark the the Sark QB? What is he looking for? What's what's kind of the prototypical Sark quarterback? Yeah, you can just kind of look at how he describes the position when he talks about running backs and quarterbacks. He talks about the runner and he talks about the passer, um, and and that's a little bit of a juxtaposition to some previous tenures at Texas where. They're looking for a dual threat guy, a guy who can do a little bit of both. Sark wants his quarterback to be able to do his damage from the pocket, uh, hitting shots downfield on play action. Um, and like Coach Williams said, likes having him 
be able to make some things work in the RPO game, which means good hands. You know, it doesn't want uh, too long of a motion. Uh, if it is long, he wants other tools to be able to mold. Uh, but he likes uh, quarterbacks that have the the requisite size. You know, you can think about Quinn Ewers from a size perspective, 6'3-ish, 200 pounds-ish. Um, that's kind of his his baseline as far as uh, positions go, uh, or as far as that position goes. He's If there's other aspects that are more valuable, that are better in those prospects, he's willing to give a little bit of leeway. Uh, but you can, and you see that in guys like not only KJ Lacey, but even going way back to Bryce Young, like that was a Sarkeesian recruit. Uh, even looking at Tua, like Tua, I think is six one, but he's got great hands and great accuracy. Uh, Mac Jones could make really good decisions uh, and also had great downfield accuracy. So he's got a type, but if there are, are traits, um, normally as it pertains to downfield accuracy and hand speed, he's willing to make some compromises, but. He wants a guy who's going to be able to pick apart teams from the pocket uh, and not so much be someone who's a dual threat quarterback by the the definition that the uh, the networks tend to give. Ian, you've been sitting very silently as your virility has been complimented. I'm I'm just curious if you would be able to expand on an article you wrote or you're currently writing right now about the linebackers. Can you expand on that a little bit and let us know what you're, what's going on on the board at InsideTexas.com? Elsie, I've written three articles about linebackers this week. I, I cannot read. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, you know, if you go over there, guys, Inside Texas right now, we've been preparing you for the off-season storylines. Yep. This, this show was the first to tell you guys that Texas was a national championship contender in 2024. What's happened since then, Elsie? There's been over-unders where Texas is up there with Georgia at the top of the SEC. SP Plus by my old colleague Bill Connolly came out today or yesterday at Texas number four. Um, all, the, all the indicators are is that this is, this is going to be the consensus. Texas is front runner next season. If you read these linebacker articles that I wrote this week, what I'm explaining to you all is Sweat, Murphy, they're gone. The strength of the defense is going to be different this year. This is a base 3-4 defense. that They have like five starting linebacker positions in the package. Um, and this is the first year that the talent level at all those linebacker positions is actually going to be anywhere close to where you would ideally want it to be. So they lose Jalen Ford. He's great. Whoever replaces him probably won't be quite as good. But the edges are going to be better. The outside linebackers. Sorrell is back. Ethan Burke is going to be a lot better in his third year. Trey Moore comes from UTSA. Uh, Colin Simmons comes in from the high school ranks. Don't forget about Colton Vosick, who is a blue chip, and everyone has already forgotten about him. Uh, Anthony Hill is coming back. His deployment this year could be the defining feature of the defense. Sophomore five-star, six and a half sacks last year, moved around a little bit, barely knew what he was doing, still made a ton of impact plays. Um, him having like sophomore sump versus sophomore breakout is another def defining feature. And just in general, I I'm explaining all this in the articles. I explain what all these different linebacker positions are, what they do and who's likely to play them. And that those spring storylines are going to be, you know, for a football junkie, they're going to be gold. And if you want a vague sense of how this team's going to be defined next year, you're going to want to have like at least a cursory knowledge of it. Is it, would you, can you expand on, I want to go back to Ian specifically about a, the linebackers that would, that would take Ford's place in the coverage area. Cause that's something that PK values, but what is your, what is your take on this linebacker room coach? They're all athletic and can run and can move in space. I think that's one of the key things, right? Um, you know, now in the, today's game, you want big safeties playing linebacker. Somebody can be physical in the box, but also can drop in the coverage and attach to people, you know, and run with those slot receivers or tight ends and, and it's up the seam. So I think we have that. And if you look at the kind of guys we're recruiting, especially here in Dallas, uh, two top guys, Raleigh Pettijohn and Elijah Bo Barnes, they're big, physical, mean, tough guys who can run and cover. And so you look at what we're recruiting and what we have on the team right now. I think we're going that direction to where we can play. Physical in the SEC, but also run with guys. 
Well, we're about to lose coach. He's got to drop off and go get his teeth whitened again. So we're going to thank you coach for being here. We got to keep that smile high and bright. We appreciate it. And I want to go back to Ian really quickly. So let's talk about that. Who is going to, to take the Ford place in terms of coverage or is even that important to us? Well, I mean, that's going to one of the things to sort out. They're going to move Hill to uh, Ford's position. I, they may tinker with the scheme this offseason to reduce uh, the responsibilities of the linebackers in coverage. They were pretty right. protected last year. They could be even more protected this year, depending on how they use the secondary. So plan A seems to be move, uh, move Hill over and then find a new weak side linebacker to do what Will did last year, to do what Hill did last year at the Will. Um, they also been, I think David Benda, who's what now, a redshirt senior guys? Is that right? Yeah. Sixth year. Sixth Six year. year. <laughs> yeah. He's actually pretty good in coverage, even though he had that blown assignment that cost them the Red River shootout. Um, in terms of like movement and, and covering slots, like Coach was just describing, I think Benda is the best guy they have. A Hill could probably be good at that with time, but he never had to do it in high school because they didn't want him to bother teaching him to do that when he could do other things so well. And Texas has taken the same approach. Are we running the risk of losing Hill at Hill's best assets by putting him in that position? No, probably not. Um, he was very good off the edge last year. I don't know if we're going to see as much of that this season, but at least theoretically, he should be a very good blitzer. Right. He's, he's so violent and he covers ground so quickly and he can get off blocks. So I, I think his most devastating deployment would be blitzing in between the tackles um, from an inside linebacker position. But then that's something else like this spring. He was pretty good at that last year. He could be a lot better. There's a lot of nuance and technique to that. Yeah. Um, and so his development there this spring is, is going to be pretty key for that. Are you hearing anything specific, Joe, going into spring about any, any players or scheme changes? You know, um, something that Ian touched on that I'm really curious to see that, that carries over touched on on inside Texas.com uh, is just deploying a three, four personnel. Um, and we talk a lot about that two, four, five look that, that Texas has that had, you know, you can look at the 2023 personnel. You had Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. You had Baron Sorrell and Ethan Burke outside. Uh, typically, you then had Ford and Benda at linebacker. And then you had five defensive backs with Jade Barron playing nickel. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious how often that they're going to have to deploy that 3-4 uh, something Ian talked about a lot is that the the reason they ran a lot of three four, at least as it pertains to the 2023 season, is that there's been kind of a big from the big bang of spread offenses in the Big 12. There was a big crunch back towards heavy personnel and fullbacks and things like that that made running a three four uh, conducive to Texas interest. I'm curious um, which SEC schools uh, are going to be a little bit more. Uh, I don't want to say receptive, but are, are going to make Texas want to run that personnel a little bit more and how they make it work. Um, as far as the the rest of it, you know, this is a big season, not only for a uh, big off season, not only for Anthony Hill, as far as learning how to drop in coverage a little bit better, uh, learning how to, you know, man the position that Jalen Ford has uh, over the past couple seasons, but also just taking control of that defense. I think if you, kind of look around at, at the offense, you understand that it, it starts and ends with Quinn Ewers. And that's not just in uh, level of play, but that's in leadership. And then you may go to Jake Majors, Kelvin Banks, uh, even some other players like uh, Gunnar Helm, uh, CJ Baxter, a number of different guys after them. It starts with Ewers, probably goes to Banks after that, but Ewers is clear number one. This is the opportunity uh, this upcoming spring for for Anthony Hill to really take control, take precedent, probably alongside Jade Barron of the the leader position on that defense, and and that that's not just because you know he's a really good player on that defense, but also that position. You know he's talking to everybody. He's talking to the defensive tackles. He's talking to the edges, talking to his fellow linebackers, talking to the secondary. Like that is someone that everybody on that defense looks to at that position 
he's got to prove that not only is he good enough to play the position, but that he's has the trust of all 10 other people on the field with him. I think that's something that the Texas coaches are looking at him taking, uh, taking grasp of. And uh, so far we've heard good things about that development in, in spring off season. Do you, do you envision yourself and your face caterpillar going to that event at the end of the, at the end of June? Do you think you'll be covering that? Um, what the which one? Well, the, the one over the SEC. That I'm just curious. Ah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, getting a chance to you know hear Chris Del Conte, uh, Board of Regents Chairman Evan, uh, Kevin Eltif, UT President Jay Hartzell talk about the the move to the SEC. SEC Commissioner Greg Sankey just being there. Like this is a chance for for Texas to. Um, in a non-embarrassing way, unlike their brethren to the east, make a splash in the SEC, but also maintain some dignity and some pride uh, about themselves as they bring burnt orange instead of bright orange into the SEC. So, yeah, I'll definitely be there. And uh, I don't know if y'all ever went to any of the events on the, the South Mall. It's not a bad venue for a concert or for a pep rally or things like that. And uh should be a, a lot of fun to see the the Texas dignitaries, whether it's uh, administration or current members of the team or the head coach himself, head coach of any sport, be there celebrating the move to a new league. I can't confirm this, but I'm here in Longhorn City Limits. Jaw rule. Can't confirm. <laughs> Just throwing okay. it out there, but jaw That's rule. Some, all right. Wow. We're, we're getting really – this is inside Texas.com at its best – we're getting we're getting scouting reports on upcoming concerts. So, Joe, I do want to appreciate you did you did rather maybe inadvertently confirm that you will have your mustache into June. So we're really looking forward to this carrying on. Ian, have you ever had a mustache? No, it's uh, not allowed. Not allowed. Yeah. That your your virility just goes off the charts at that point. You just can't. You got to maintain that four level of kids, right? I understand that. Has been more the opposite. Oh, I see. He looks like Ron Swanson when he grows his mustache, and I don't think Cat's into that. Oh, On Joe's course. side, though, I don't think Miss Miss Cook is going to let him shave. No. After these last few weeks and after Valentine's, that I think that thing might be sticking. I'll tell you what, yeah, Joe's absolutely. Joe's cadence with the mustache it just it's huh? like you're uh, hearing from a cop. Yeah, absolutely. If Dateline isn't outside his door right now, I'm shocked. No, it's it's true. I mean, it's going to go one of two ways. He's either going to have a panel van handwritten in graffiti free ice cream or or basically a Pontiac Firebird. There's just no two ways about it. He's Something's happening with Joe. Oh, by the way, we've gone off the rails a little bit here, and I want to thank you for joining us at InsideTexas.com for our Saturday roundtable. Unless you boys have anything else to add to the fine folks, I think we should let them carry on with their long weekend. Anything from you guys? I should probably stop saying anything else. Yeah, you probably should. <laughs> it's unfortunate that this particular episode wasn't sponsored by Andre the Lawyer because I feel like we're all going to need him in a libel case later. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Take care.